Good morning and welcome to our modern worship service. As you can see, I still have my post-Easter scruff, and that is because I have spent a week in Sacramento with my family, and we've had a good time, and now I'm taking a couple of weeks of reading and writing. But I came back for one reason, and that is to welcome you to this very exciting worship service that I'm going to tell you more about in a moment. We have a guest preacher named the Reverend Dr. Tom Taylor, and I'll tell you more about him in a moment. But this is the day the Lord has made, so let's rejoice and be glad in it. It all comes down to this What you require of me Love my neighbor as myself And you above all things Act justly Love mercy Walk humbly With you God In all things in all ways, walk humbly with you, God. It all comes down to this, to be your hands and feet. Good news to all the world, the truth will set us free. Act justly, love mercy. Thank you, worship band, for that amazing new song, Act Justly. We're going to hear a lot more of that, and I just love it. It also leads into our incredible talk today by the Reverend Dr. Tom Taylor. Now, you may know him as the CEO of the Presbyterian Foundation. He literally oversees like a $100 billion endowment from good people like you who have given to the Presbyterian Foundation. You may know him as the former Deputy Executive Director of the Presbyterian Church USA. That is the number three person in charge of the whole denomination. But I got to know Tom growing up because he was my pastor. Literally, he was my youth pastor in Salt Lake City, Utah. And whenever I had a problem or an issue or a trouble, I went to Tom. And I still do that today. So today, Tom's going to give us some wisdom and some words from the Bible. And I can't wait to introduce you to the Reverend Dr. Tom Taylor. Welcome. I want to thank you and your pastor for inviting me to speak this morning on this topic that uh, I know you guys talk about periodically in your church. And uh, I just so appreciate your church and your pastor and your staff and all the great things that you're doing. So thanks for letting me be a part of this. Question, why should Christians even talk about justice? Isn't that the job really of government? And it's certainly true that the government definitely deals with all kinds of aspects of justice. But I have to say that when we look at the passage that you've heard today, it tells us really clearly that God has a significant call for Christians when it comes to the issue of justice. The Isaiah passage that was just read says some pretty startling things about justice. It tells us some things about the importance of justice, the meaning of justice, 
and actually about how to become people who do justice. So let me talk about each of those three a little bit this morning. The importance of justice. The story of Isaiah 58 begins where God's talking about a peculiar people, a particular people, his people who are worshiping. And he says that day after day they seek me out and worship. He says they're eager to know my ways. They're passionate about things like fasting. They're, they're, they're punctual about things like getting together for worship. So it seems like they appear consistent. And yet in verse 3, God's not answering their prayers. And instead, actually, bad things are happening to them. Why, they say, God, aren't you listening? And actually, God's response in verses 5 through 7 of that chapter tell us some kind of interesting and startling things. God says, let me tell you what worship and fasting of me are really about. Let me tell you, let me explain to you what it really means to have a genuine relationship with me as your God. And he says in verse 6, is it not to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, to break every yoke, is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn them away from your own flesh and blood? Now I have to tell you, Jesus draws very heavily on this passage and others in the Old Testament that are like it. Listen very closely to the echoes that you're going to hear in passages like the one that he talks about in the book of Matthew where Jesus is describing judgment day. And he said that the Lord will have those in front of him who really knew him and those who he did not know. And here's how it reads in Matthew 25, 34 through 40 and verse 45. Jesus says, Then the king will say to those on the right, Come you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. And when I was sick, you looked after me. When I was in prison, you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to visit you? And the kingdom will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And then he says in verse 45, and he will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Now, if that makes you feel a little bit uneasy, I think that's probably a good sign. Because I think it tells you something about the tenderness of your heart still being open to hear God's call. A few years ago, I was able to go to uh, visit a mission in uh, the Ukraine. It was a mission called God's Hidden Treasures. And it was just outside a sort of impoverished town in central Ukraine called Bilitserkva. This mission had been started by a pretty average uh, American woman uh, in her middle life. She had gone through a tough period of life, had just been divorced, and uh, uh, she decided to go on a mission trip to Ukraine. And when she went, she was so deeply moved by the difficulties with people's lives there, by the alcoholism, and especially by the difficulties of people at the bottom of the sort of social rungs those people like children and those who were disabled, that she decided she needed to sell the things that she had in the United States and go over and start this ministry there to help minister to those people. See, she was particularly preoccupied with kids in orphanages because in that kind of context in, in uh, Ukraine, when children are mentally or seriously physically disabled, they're often dropped off at these orphanages to live for their lives. Nita explained that um, very often when these kids turn about five or six years old, they're brought into a room of four or five experts who sit around and observe them. And if the kids turn out to be uh, somehow uh, less than normal, uh, uh, less than acceptable in society, they're actually deemed what are called imbeciles. And they're relegated back into this orphanage system for the rest of their lives. And I remember Anita said that it was truly like a life sentence for a child. She described her own initial experiences when she went there and what drew her there and felt God's call to go there. She said the first time that she visited one of these orphanages, she actually went into the infant area where they were anywhere from infants to kids one and a half, maybe two years old. She said it was a dark windowless room and all the cribs were pushed up against the side. 
And she went over to one of those cribs and she, she stuck her finger into, those, into that crib and a little boy reached up and grabbed her finger. She reached down into the crib and picked him up and she said that that little boy gripped her around her neck and just hugged her and held on to her so that they had to actually ply this child off. She said when she experienced that, she said, Tom, she said, I knew immediately what it meant to feel my heart break with the things that break God's heart. You know, when I myself held the hands of one of those children in Ukraine, it bothered me because I knew as I held that child's hand and I looked into that child's eyes, I knew that the God who created my two boys was the same God who created this little child and that God's plan for this child was the same as the one for my boys to create chances and opportunities for a good life. But given the status of this kid that I was looking at without someone like Nita, what kind of a chance does a child like that really have? It bothered me because I believe, frankly, it was the sense of the Holy Spirit pulling at my heart. That's why I think it bothers you and I both. It bothers us because the Holy Spirit's convicting us and telling us something about your and my moral Christian life. It's not just about what we do wrong, it's about what we don't do right. Question, could all of this in Isaiah and Jesus' teachings be summarized just this starkly? That God is saying, look, if you don't love the poor, if you don't love the hungry, if you don't care about the naked, all enough to do at least something in your life for them, then you don't love me. You don't really have a relationship with me. Oh, you relate to me in certain ways, and you go to certain meetings, or maybe you have a Bible study or something else. But do you really have a relationship with me because I deeply and desperately love these folks, these people that I'm talking about, and you don't have a relationship with them at all, even though you see them and you know of them. Now, make no mistake about it. I'm not saying in any way that I think we earn God's favor uh, by doing things and doing works for him. The Bible tells us the opposite of that. In fact, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, uh, not of works. It's not the things that you're doing. Otherwise, people could boast about it. So what does it mean when we decide to do God's justice? What's God talking about here? I think it means that what we do when God calls us to do things and we do those things, we don't do it to earn God's favor. We do it because we already have it. We do it because as God's already lavished on us graciously his mercy and his care. And so out of response to that, you and I do justice, and our reaction to that becomes a barometer, a genuine barometer for our faith in God and our understanding of God's love for us. So whether you claim to be a Christian or not, if you're listening to this today, I simply want you to see that doing justice is at the heart of the Bible, and in fact, it's at the heart of the teachings of Jesus Christ for people who want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, if that describes the importance of justice, what describes the meaning of justice? Well, why is it that God might say that justice goes together with a genuine relationship with God? Why in the world would God connect these things so deeply and so integrally? I think in part it's because when the Bible talks about justice, it's actually different than when you and I normally talk about justice in our contemporary Western world. When we talk about justice, uh, we talk about things that are important, and some of those things, by the way, are in scriptures. We talk about fair treatment. We talk about laws against uh, certain crimes. We talk about protecting property. And those things are in the Bible, and they're important. But actually, when the Bible goes on and talks about justice in passages like this Isaiah passage that we're looking at and many others, always underneath the discussion is the value and desire for something, a, a concept that's really pregnant called shalom. And it's often translated in Hebrew from Hebrew as peace, but it's actually so much more. It's a very specific kind of peace. The Isaiah passage is wrapped in the understanding of peace, Actually, in the following chapter after Isaiah 58, and Isaiah 58, 9, it says, The way of peace or shalom they do not know. There is no justice in their path. The notion of shalom and justice are integrally linked in the Bible. What's God talking about here? Well, at the foundation of the Hebrew Bible, 
God created the world actually to be woven together. We see that in the Genesis narrative and other places in the Bible. God created a sense of shalom that people were supposed to live in, in all of life and all of the environment, all of the world. Shalom is what people still say today in Israel when they pass one another in the streets, peace be with you. It's sometimes translated as completeness. What's the significance of it? Well, if I were to take a, a bunch of spools of thread or yarn and just throw them down in the middle of the room, it wouldn't be a fabric. It'd just be a pile of spools and yarn. But if somebody who was really skilled took those and they began weaving them in and out of one another in each direction, every direction, and do it more tightly and more tightly, they'd actually become interdependent. And when that happens, actually you begin to see that this fabric Something turns into a fabric that's even more beautiful and it gets stronger and it gets more useful and warmer and something that's actually of great value. Now the Bible's description of the creation of the world in the Old Testament is actually much like that. It describes that God created all these different things and entities in the, in the Genesis narrative, but these weren't just supposed to exist independently of one another and just sit there. In fact, these entities were actually supposed to be interdependent. They were supposed to be harmonious and knitted together in beautiful relationship with one another. I'll give you some examples. When your body is working healthily, it means that all of your various body parts and systems are actually working together. You experience a sense of physical shalom. And in fact, when you're sick, it's just the opposite. Psychologically, your inner psyche, your emotions, your, 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 your conscience, your, your reason, when all those things are working together, we sometimes say you're at rest or you're at peace. You're experiencing that sense of internal shalom. Or when we put it in social settings, and when people have money and resources and advantages, and they take those things and they plunge them and invest them into the community around them, you begin to see things like great parks and people having homes and great schools and hospitals and all of the other things that make for a great place to live and a good life. The community is experiencing that sense of social shalom. But conversely, when those with great resources hold them all to themselves, they ignore their communities, they ignore their church, they ignore their neighborhoods, Actually, pretty soon you begin to see if that happens long enough, things begin to unravel. Now, you realize how different this is from the way that we often in the West talk about justice. Very often in the West we'll talk about justice, we're talking about individual rights, about freeing individuals from the group rather than being a part of it no matter what the group says. And don't get me wrong. I'm as American as anybody on this topic, and I frequently find myself saying things that I think most of us as Americans say, you know, that I want to stand up for my rights, I want to listen to my heart, I want to follow my instincts, you know, I want to have it my way and the things that we say as individualism in terms of individualism of Americans. But remember something else, that along with those kinds of systems that we commit to and we set up, it also means that we're also setting up systems where, for instance, pornography publishers get to publish the, the smuttiest kind of material that exploits everybody that has anything to do with it to our own detriment. It means that people get to follow cult leaders even to their own deaths. It means that people get to start businesses, startups, and they, they can take people's money and actually often offer very little in exchange. By contrast, the biblical notion of justice has a very different trajectory because it's about our interdependence. It's about us coming to realize that our stuff is really on loan from God and we're just stewards of it for a lifetime. It's about the fact that life isn't all about you and me and our immediate desires for what we want. Let me illustrate a little bit about what I mean. In nearly every city in the country, including yours and mine, there are schools and neighborhoods that are so ill-equipped to help kids in really tough situations that regularly, and, and by that I mean predictably, by the time many of those kids are 12, 13, 14, and 15 years old, they're functionally illiterate. They can't read or write. Now at that age and forward, when you begin life unable to read or write, 
you really are seeking a life and starting a life of ruin in many ways. If you can't read or write, you, you, you can't fill out a job application. And even if someone fills it out for you, you can't read to get on public transit to use it to get back and forth there or to get a license and on and on this goes. And you begin to see that we've got a whole body of society that's, that's suffering because of this. Now, why is this happening? Well, typically, when you ask that question, it's analyzed according to, to, to sort of either liberal or conservative political ideologies. And so a liberal analysis might say to that, well, that's happening because of unjust social structures. And the truth is, there's a lot of truth to that. And conservative political systems might say something like, well, that's happening because of a breakdown of the family. And that's certainly true as well. But the interesting thing that we're reading and we're drawn to in the Old Testament passage today and in Jesus' teachings is that for the Christian, we have to observe another aspect of it. And that is, nobody says it's that kid's fault. Nobody says at seven or eight years old, that kid should have started saying, hey, we got to move to a better school district. At seven or eight years old, that kid should have said to his parents, I think you're committing mal parental malpractice here. You got to read to me more. Nobody says that that boy or girl at seven or eight years old should have started to, you, you know, say I, they need to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. Otherwise, it's their fault. It's not their fault. And none of us would say that. And yet the simple fact is that a child that's born into most of our families here today has about a three to four hundred times greater chance of economic and social flourishing and greater general happiness in life than kids that are born into those neighborhoods and into those school situations. And it's a clear example of a very serious injustice that exists in our world, frankly, not very many miles from where you and I live today. Or what about another example internationally? Haiti's house children. Some years back, I worked in Haiti for a group called World Team. The adult mortality rate in Haiti is very high. And that means that many kids become orphaned without parents early on. And when that happens, if they're lucky, they'll get to go to a caring relative. But frankly, far too much of the time, they only have a distant relative, or in many cases, only a neighbor that they're handed off to. And when that happens, they actually move into a social convention in Haiti that actually still exists. It's called Timun Lakai, or house children, house child. And that means that that child is there to work. And in those homes, uh, when that happens, the parents uh, don't show physical affection in most cases in any way at all to those children. They're there to work. They're not allowed to play with other children because they're there to work. The parents say, well, we don't want to show them physical affection and do many things for them because if we do, it'll give them hope that we can send them to school and we can't afford to do that. So instead, they are just simply there to work. They don't live in the house typically. There were many, many situations where I would go out back of the small houses that were already poor and there was a mat there and that's where those children, I mean little children in some cases, they would live. Maybe there was a lean-to to stop the rain or possibly in some rare cases, they would stay in a shed very often with animals. But that's where those kids lived. And very often, because they were there to work, if they didn't do what was required, it was not uncommon for them to be beaten and sometimes brutally. I'll never forget being at Bonfen Hospital, where I worked for a little while in a, in a mountainous area between Port-au-Prince and a town called Okai. And very, very early in the morning, a little boy was brought in. He was four years old, and he had been beaten with a horse whip so badly he was almost dead. And I'll never forget the the doctor just holding that child and just bewildered, she just said, isn't it crazy? She said, we won't even let our own kids play with matches. Now let me ask you something. When you hear that, do you think to yourself that's fair? No matter what those kids' parents have done, is that fair to the kids? Whatever your political or economic views might be, if for some reason you were dying, let's say, God forbid, and you had to hand off your children to live in a situation like that, would that be okay? And let's say that if that happened to you, and then you learned that there were millions of Christians 
just 700 miles off the coast of where you were, and they had more than enough means and capability to actually help in those situations, but you learned that they weren't doing anything about it, even if they learned of it. And instead, they were actually feeding comparatively lavish lifestyles for their own, on, on their own and for themselves. Would you look at that and say that those people reflected the love of God for you and for your kids? Surely not. That's what I think the Bible is saying about us in justice. If I, as a Christian, do nothing to share the advantages that I have and that the world has dealt me with those who are needing, the Lord's saying in Isaiah, that's unjust, isn't it? But here's the best news of all. What if one of those suffering kids nationally or internationally. What if a single mom who's gotten in a real bind and, and, and has nothing and can't fend for her own kids financially, not because of anything she's done. What if an elderly person is out there and has no family and they've lost everything and they're on the streets. What if right now one of those people is praying and just saying, Lord, they know the Lord, they're, they're Christians, they're saying, Lord, please send someone to help me. I, I, I'm at the end of my rope. I'm too little to, to fight the people I'm around. I don't have the money to pay my rent or buy food for my kids. I don't have anybody in my life left. Please send somebody help me, Lord. What if the person God uses to answer that prayer is you? How cool is that? How cool is that that you and I get to be God's instruments to help heal the sufferings of others who are experiencing untold injustices. So how do you and I become people who do justice? I think it starts actually with getting in the right head and heart space. One of the first things when I talk to people about this topic is don't operate out of guilt. Whenever I speak about this topic, and I talk to Christians who want to be faithful just like you, especially when I talk to people in North America or wealthier countries around the world, they often feel guilty. Don't do that. Why? Because actually doing things out of guilt doesn't work. In fact, it, in fact, it often does the opposite of what we want. You skip doing the right thing once and then you let it pass and the guilt goes away pretty quickly. And then you might skip it again and pretty soon you realize what's happened is you become pretty callous to the very thing that made you guilty in the first place. As a, motiva as a motivation, I have to tell you, guilt doesn't work. So don't do it that way, and don't make others feel that way either. Now, instead of turning to guilt, turn to personal reflection. And let me encourage you to start by just asking a simple question. If the Bible's teachings in the Old Testament and Jesus' teachings on justice don't define my life in any way, what does define my life? Now, I have to tell you that when I've asked this question to people in groups, and, and it's very genuine and it's not threatening, we're just really trying to be honest with one another and with ourselves, I've gotten actually a series of pretty consistent answers. Very often, one of the answers, one of the first answers that people would say is, you know, truthfully, I'm driven by consumerism. I find myself thinking almost constantly about what the next thing is I, I need or want to get the next trip, the next car, the next house, something for my kids that I think is going to fulfill me. And as soon as I hear that, I want to ask people, have you ever identified when enough would be enough for you? Another thing people say is, I'm focusing on advancing my career or my social status. And that can be a noble thing, can be a wonderful thing. But as soon as I hear that, I think to myself, once you get where you want to get, to what end have you gotten there? And what will be the point of who you are? And if you lose that position and you lose that status, then what? Will everything about who you are because it was based on what you do be lost? Or will there still be somebody there who really matters to yourself and others around you? I think maybe most frequently I'll hear people say, well, I just want my own happiness. I want the happiness of myself and my family. But we almost never find happiness, I have to tell you, by chasing it. I don't think I've ever met anybody who's really found true happiness by saying, I'm just going to look for it my, my whole life. 
it just seems really clear to me that happiness winds up coming as a byproduct of doing things in life that are meaningful and very often doing things in life that are meaningful for other people. Remember, Jesus didn't say, I came that you might have guilt and unhappiness. He said in John 10.10, 10, I came that you might have life and live it to the fullest abundance. He wants those things for you. But he tells us there's a way to get at him, and he's describing them in these passages. Well, once you've gotten in kind of the right head and heart space, then consider taking a few small steps to practice heading toward the direction of doing God's justice. First thing I'd say is, do things that are based on who you are. You know, you're unique. And by that, it means that God's given you certain skills and talents, and you've developed certain gifts and talents over the years. And those combined with your life experiences, both good and bad, means you have capabilities that no one else on the planet has to reach out to other people. Take those things that you feel called to, that you know you're good at, and pray and ask the Lord to bring people into your life and seek people out who you know they need those skills that you have. It may be counseling. It may be that you are a good builder. It may be that you give good legal advice. It may be that you're in the healthcare industry and can help. It may be that you're just a person who knows how to have a ministry of presence and care with people, whatever it is. Take those things that are unique to you and seek people out. And you know what? Begin by just reaching out and befriending those folks in need. Be sure that when you do it, you see Jesus Christ in them. Don't do it to say, wow, you know, I really feel good about myself. Do it to see Jesus Christ in them. Why do I say that? Because remember what Jesus said? He said, when you do these things to care for the least in these world, you do it for me. Do it because you're looking for Jesus in those folks. And do these things together in your Christian community. Do them with your church collectively. Ask what our church can do uniquely and collectively to right injustices that are damaging people all around you. A community of young Christian students that I know of uh, took over an old broken down cathedral in Philadelphia that was gonna be condemned. They began ministering in this area that was being ravaged by poverty. And one Sunday, they hung out an enormous banner out in the front of the church that they had made. And the banner read with a question. It said, can we worship a homeless guy on Sunday mornings and ignore a homeless person on Monday? Let me close with this. I was a pastor's kid growing up. And when I grew up, I had to go to church a lot. And uh, I heard a lot of preachers, uh, including some real firebrands, talk about hell and heaven. I remember one time when I was uh, nine years old, I think it was, um, I had to go to an evening service where an evangelist had come to town and, and we were supposed to hear him. And I had to sit almost in the front row of this meeting. And toward the end of his message, he had really gotten whipped up and he was shouting about things and talking about heaven and hell. And he looked, leaned over the pulpit and he looked right down at me and he pointed right at me and he said, are you ready to die? And I thought, I'm nine. <laughs> now I gotta tell you, heaven is a wonderful promise. It's a beautiful promise, but you know something? It's not God's initial preoccupation with us as humans. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do to understand God's primary purpose and God's immediate purpose, it's spelled out in Jesus' very famous prayer where he says that it's God's will, that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And guess who God wants to use as an agent to carry out that will? You and me. Mother Teresa said today, she said, let us do small things with great love or not answer the door at all. I love that because it shows us it's not about how much we do. It's about how much God's love has truly transformed you to love others. So when you as Christians determine that you want to heal injustices where they live, go to those places where they're crushing people. Go to those places where they're breaking, they're robbing, they're defiling, they're humiliating people. And when you do that, I'll tell you something, it'll make the good news of the gospel actually sound like good news. Isaiah chapter 52, 
says one last beautiful verse I'll share. It says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, shalom, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. I pray that ultimately the beautiful feet that bring that good news of God's justice in a crying world will be yours and mine. Thanks for your faithfulness in doing it. Will we ever rise? Will we ever rise above the fear? Can we learn to see the need? Can we share humanity? I can see another day come. Broken people, we can be made whole. We can be made whole. We can be made whole. As we lay down our weapons, open up our eyes. Love is breaking us, love remaking us. Will we ever rise? Will we ever rise above the pain? Can we learn another way? Forgive as you forgive. I can see another day come Broken people, we can be made whole We can be made whole We can be made whole As we lay down our weapons Open up our eyes Love is breaking us Stephen Hall and the band introduced us to that over Lent, and I just love it. Now here are two important things before we close today. If you loved today's talk as much as I did, you want to meet with Tom Taylor this coming Wednesday night, April 21st at 7 p.m. on Zoom. That's right, you will have a chance to have a conversation about race, about justice, about some of the atrocities that we're seeing in our country right now. You will get a chance to ask an expert in person over Zoom. Don't miss that this coming Wednesday. Then on Thursday night, we have a very special event for all parents who are helping their kids to transition back into in-person learning. I know as a parent, this is gonna be a transition for our kids, so don't miss that. That will also be a Zoom conversation April 22nd at 7 p.m. But until we meet again, go in peace and know that the God of justice will walk with you in Jesus' name.